here, folks. We've got another discussion here uh, before we take a bit of a break, and so I'm really looking forward to learning what we can from this panel here about the future of ag automation and what that looks like and what are the hurdles to achieving kind of the maximum potential of that ag automation. And joined by three folks that I think are going to be able to shed quite a bit of light on the subject. Uh, joined uh, my far left, your far right, by uh, Gino Caffiero with uh, Bear Flag Robotics. Uh, next to him is Paul Mikesell with Carbon Robotics. And last but certainly not least, Joni Welfel of the Far West Equipment Dealers Association. Appreciate all of you taking some time here today. And uh, Gino, I want to go to you first. And for, for, for you and Paul, it'll probably be the same kind of question. I wonder if you could just kind of give us your 30-second elevator speech, what your company is, how you fit into the agricultural automation space, uh, and what kind of uh, crops and geographies y'all are currently functioning at this point. For sure. Um, thanks, Spencer. It's a thrill to be here. Thank you, everyone in the audience as well. Um, my name, as Spencer said, my name's Egino Cafiero. I'm one of the founders of a company called Bear Flag Robotics. Um, and if you're familiar with Bear Flag, it was because we built autonomous technology for farm tractors. Um, we started the company in 2016, um, really, really got our toehold. Well, uh, we got our toehold in Salinas with um, lettuce and then um, started uh, building autonomous solutions in cotton um, and uh, other crops as well. But um, more notably, we were acquired by John Deere in 2021. Um, which was a, um, a, a fortuitous moment because now the technology we're developing can scale and the team specifically is working on autonomy in high value crops. So um, what that looks like is um, autonomy in tree nut orchards today. Thanks. Very good. Paul, what's, uh, what can you tell us about Carbon? Yeah, hi, I'm Paul Mike Sell, the founder and CEO of Carbon Robotics. We make the laser weeder. We kill weeds in farmers' fields with very high-powered lasers. The lasers are targeted with our AI systems that find these weeds automatically live in the fields. This means you can kill weeds without needing to apply herbicides, without needing to put people in your field spraying stuff. It means you don't have to tear up the topsoil. Um, and it's very effective, very efficient. People seem to like it. Uh, we have machines all through Salinas and um, a bunch of stuff all through the rest of California. We have machines in Idaho, New Mexico, Texas, uh, a lot of stuff in Washington, Oregon. This year we're deploying uh, to Michigan, to Florida, to Georgia, some stuff in upstate New York. We have things in Canada. And now we have some of our first sales in Europe, which we'll be delivering next year. So things are moving fast. Um, and if you've seen the videos online, um, please share those around. We love media attention. If you haven't, go ahead and take a look. Search for Laser Weeder. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff to see. Very good. Joni, what can you tell us about, uh, I know you're maybe not the, uh, you know, ha having an innovation as, as these uh, two gentlemen are, but what can you tell us about kind of FUIDA's role in, uh, in the ag automation space? Well, Far West Equipment Dealers Association represents equipment dealers in seven western states, including Colorado, California. And, uh, you know, right now, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, GPS navigation on board. About 50% of uh, farmers have adopted some of the crop protection and, and um, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're, you're um, fine. The crop protection and the uh, weeding, mm -hmm. and um, about 80% of them use it for data collection. So it's still a, a, an emerging technology, and uh, I think that our, our dealers are saying that they expect, especially in the, in the specialty crop area, to really boom in the next two to three years, but some of the other applications are a little bit slower to adoption. So, uh, Gino, I, I want to circle back to you because you, you talk about uh, court, sort of a, I mean, pl and please correct me if I'm wrong in this phrasing, but sort of a bolt-on solution to, to automation on an existing tractor is, is what you all kind of hang your hat on. What are the challenges that you're helping our producers solve through that kind of, uh, through that kind of application? Yeah, Spencer, thanks. Um, so Bear Flag as a company was doing just that. We were, um, we were a technology developer, and um, as a startup, we identified that um, we we really had no business building tractors, um, which was obvious to us. Um, and we, we partnered with OEMs, most significantly John Deere. And so we built our technology that could be bolted on to John Deere's. And if you look at our website, it's 
tragically dated, but um, you'll see autonomous ADARs driving around. <clears throat> More specifically, Spencer, the um, the technology that you either you know bolt on or you get you know what we call it dear like in base. So you buy like an ADAR or a five ML or whatever that has autonomy. Um, that's it's like less less of the focus of where the technology is, and I'd say uh, more directly to your point, like what we're helping do is um, really getting getting workers out of either hard hard jobs that are just like difficult on their bodies, helping farmers with time crunches. So how can they do more in less time? Um, and then most recently, just getting um, workers away from chemicals, right? Um, um, if if you go out to a you know to a tree nut orchard today in Sacramento, you'll see folks. In, full suits with respirators and you know gloves and all sorts of safety equipment. Um, and so we're taking the next step, just get them further away from that. And that includes, of course, like heat exhaustion and things like that too. It's so obviously a, a laser weeder. Uh, I would think the the producer application is pretty self explanatory in the in the name. But you know, as as you look to continue deploying that technology, let's say you get the you know the wild hair to add a new uh, crop to the list of of uh, of those that are currently acceptable to the technology. Can you just walk us through the process of getting from you know square one to commercialization of the ability of your technology to work on a new crop? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that is one of our specialties, really, is bringing on new crops very quickly. We can bring on a brand new crop, something we've never seen before, in 24 to 48 hours. Part of that is because we own our computer vision stack. We have a, we have a group of technologists that are probably best in the industry at this computer vision problem. The general technology is a deep learning neural net. It's a subset of AI. Um, and the basic principle is... Um, the neural net is millions of what we call neurons, which are essentially just gates written in software that are run on a GPU. That's why GPUs are important for this process, because of the vectorization needs. And you take a, num a lot of pictures, and you label those images to say what's in the picture. And over time, if you feed the neural net this data, it will begin to learn. Okay? And so this process is what we call training. Um, but we've built a very special purpose-built computer vision AI stack for this. And I think one of the things that sets us apart is we did develop our own neural nets from the beginning. And that was an important step for us to be fast and agile. And that's why we're the best in the industry at that in particular. We did take a completely different path than Gino took because um, we could not build on top of an existing platform. Um, we needed to build the whole machines ourselves. And in fact, there was an incredible amount of, of headwind against us because and when we started, everybody says you couldn't kill weeds with, with lasers. And in fact, everybody told us that it had been tried and it just didn't work. So, but we had it working. <laughs> so sometimes you're in that scenario and you have to think, well, did I just totally miss something or am I going to plow forward? And so we ran enough experiments to feel like we... Uh, knew the answer to the question, but really we couldn't have done it without the support of our grower and farmer partners, and we really saw our initial customers as more of partners than just, than, than just customers, and I think that's an important aspect for everybody to be successful in ag tech, I'm sure you did the same, is you're working with your farmers as partners, not just customers, um, and so we learned a lot from that process. So, I mean, sticking with, with you for a second then, I mean, you, you mentioned that you, you just didn't have the ability to be kind of bolt on. You needed to have the, to basically develop your own apparatus as part of this. Why not? I mean, uh, you know, why was a pull type piece of equipment necessary for your, for your application? Yeah, it's, you know, the first thing we built actually was a self-driving uh, version of this technology. And those machines we still have running, we use them for sales demos. Um, the reasons why we didn't continue with that as a production product was primarily because we needed to build something bigger so that we could get more acres done, um, and we did not want to solve too many problems at once. So we really wanted to focus on laser weeding, getting laser weeding out there. And I think the other thing was, if you want to have, you can have this debate, you know, about do I want all of these specialized independent machines that drive around on their own? Or do I want self-driving tractors that pull stuff around? And I think people go back and forth on that question, but really we felt like we need to focus on the laser weeder and get the laser weeder going. Uh, so that's what we did. Um, and it's been, you know, it's turned out to work a lot, but we also ran into a lot of scenarios in just egg autonomy where 
it was the exemption, the special cases that just drove us crazy. Um, I'm sure you ran into a bunch of this center pivot irrigation rigs that are that are moving through the field, and if you don't detect them in time, it gets it gets quite quite dangerous. Um, sometimes you know the turnaround area was near the edge of a cliff, and it, you know a slight mistake would cause your machine to go down it, you know, into a pretty serious scenario. Um, you have a lot of the times there's more co coordination that needs to happen with the grower about when are you going to move these irrigation pipes? Oh, they're not. They're not moved yet. Who do I have to get a hold of to move them, right? That happens a lot. Um, there's also the autonomy problem of how do I get my tractor out of the shed into the field? Can it do that navigation on its own or not? That's a whole, there's a whole series of stacked up of things. So that's why we chose to focus on just the machine that was the lazy weeder plugs into a tractor. So uh, Gino, Paul just mentioned a whole lot of questions that go along with, with autonomy, and, and I feel like I can't you know, continue the conversation without directing some of them toward you. I mean, when, I guess I'll, I'll phrase up the question this way. When, when a new producer you know, s decides to invest in, in your technology, what is, the, what is the education curve like, and what do you need that producer to know once, you know, before they're actually operational with your technology? Yeah, I, lo I love this prompt, and just to come back to it, right, autonomy is really hard. Um, uh, um, you know, certainly like Carbon realized this too, but, but others who aren't here, and I won't mention them by name, right, like um, there's a lot of companies that come up that say, we're going to do this task and it's going to be autonomous, or we're going to do this job step and it's going to be autonomous, and um, you, like credit to them when they're able to do that, but that, it's hard. We, we spent, you know, five years focused solely on autonomy and made a remarkable amount of progress in a short amount of time, but um, it, was ex it was because we were exclusively focused on autonomy and, the, you know, we were doing tillage, um, which is, um, you know, one of the more e one of the easier jobs on the farm, um, just because of all the special cases and all the corner cases. I think the underrate Spencer to answer your question directly, um, we we think of we think of in our program development like these three pillars, um, which is safety, quality, and usability. And I think the most underrated challenge in ag tech, um, and this will be controversial, but is usability, right? Like, how can this just be falling out of bed easy? Like, and the example I always give is I, I have a cell phone in my pocket. It's like one of these iPhones, right? And um, you know, it's the most incredible piece of technology that I own, but neither I nor my four-year-old daughter have ever read the instruction manual, and we use it, we use it just fine. Um, it can access all the world's information and take pictures of ourselves making silly faces, and that's what ag tech needs to do. We need to emulate that usability where it's just intuitive um, and a delightful user experience. Now, agriculture has a lot of challenges compared to a closed ecosystem that Apple produces. Like, um, by its nature, what we're talking about is just the variability, like how many cases are, how can we make every single case intuitive? How can we make you know, different soil types or different occlusions or different everything, um, different implements all intuitive? Um, but that, that's the challenge to us. Um, and I can, I can raise my hand and say Bear Flag didn't have that solved. Um, by the time, you know, when we joined forces with John Deere, but it's one of our, um, our most primary, like, it, it, it is, it is um, the shiny object here. So Joni, as, uh, as Egino and Paul and folks like them are coming out with new uh, shiny objects, as, as Egino just put it, what has the process been like for, for your dealer network to work to adapt to these innovations that are coming out, uh, communicate those innovations to customers, but also understand where they can, there's those technologies can and cannot be used in some of the various geographies that, uh, that your network exists. Well, and I think that they've pretty much laid out the challenge for dealers because there are so many different applications, so many di different types of crops, so many different dynamics. Uh, one of the primary ones is, is just autonomous equipment in general, like here in California, where you know the state isn't really embracing it the way it needs to be to roll it out um, widely. And, um, and other states are. Um, you know, the specialty crop, you know, there's so many different types of crops and different ways to harvest the crops that, as they said, I think they really, you know, really hit the nail on the head that um, because there's so much out there, the dealers have a really hard time trying to figure out which shiny object to go after. And I think that's one of the things that we've heard the most is because there's such a diversity in it. Um, they're looking at very, a lot of different things going to a lot of different places, and they are learning because they are the ones that have to pass on that knowledge to the end user. And we're seeing that a lot of this technology is going, like you said, directly to the end user, not necessarily through the dealer. 
So when they're trying to figure out the, the very complicated mix of policy landscape and product landscape, I mean, how do they decide where to focus their attention? Because I imagine they don't want to spend a whole lot of time learning about a product that they're not going to be able to sell one of their customers. How, how do they choose to, you know, div you know, divide their attention? And is the current, you know, trepidation that we see at the kind of the state government level in California toward automation and maybe more toward, uh, you know, the favor of folks like labor union groups? Do you think that has the potential to hamper the adoption? Of, of automation or the willingness at least of your dealers to enter into a sales relationship with it. Absolutely. I think that the climate in California related to that is why are you going to invest all this time and effort in something that you're not going to be able to widely use until it's adopted. And basically what it's done is it's created a, they call it the, the kitty hawk of innovation in Arizona, which has benefited from this tremendously. They became proactive. Um, they developed a qualified facilities tax credit for it. And so I think you're gonna see in places like that, a lot of the adoption is it's gonna be, they're gonna embrace it more. Um, as far as which ones they adopt, basically what I, in talking to our dealers, a lot of it is dependent upon geography, where you are, what type of crops, who your customers are. You know, some, some of our, one of our dealers in particular I'm thinking about, they really do focus on specialty crops and um, orchards and nuts, and so they tend to gravitate toward that type of technology. And I, and I, you know, they went to FIRA last year, a few of them, just to see what was out there. Um, I think events that highlight that type of technology are a really good thing for dealers, too, because it, it, it exposes them to it versus, like, you guys, because you're affiliated with Deer, they're going to learn about yours. Right, but they're not going to know everything that's out there. And then the other part of it is what their what their customers are asking them for. You know, what what problem do you want to solve today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and and I'd, I'd be interested in hearing the thoughts from uh, from you to uh, Paul and and Agino. Wondering as we look at the state of California, kind of looking to get its uh, kind of uh, kind of wrap its head around how it will choose to approach autonomy within uh, agriculture or within really just general uh, employment uh, heavy sectors. Is there concern that the, the kind of the foot dragging approach to maybe uh, dive headfirst into it is going to uh, impede the abilities of, of your companies to um, you know build a the size of a customer base you would probably like in a state uh, with the agricultural diversity of California? I mean, I think it's going to also impede the the growers because the the truth of the matter is what they're suffering from is a lack of labor. And so the autonomy solves that problem. We're not talking about kicking people out of jobs. We're talking about filling a hole where they're not, the jobs are not currently getting filled. The other thing is you got to remember that in, in other areas, for example, like you mentioned Arizona, uh, also Europe, right? They love autonomy over there. So in, in the areas where uh, we have a global marketplace, if you put yourself at a disadvantage because you're, you're, you're limiting the advancements in technology to help you be more efficient, then what are you really achieving? Um, particularly as if most of our labor is coming up from Mexico and they can grow crops just as well down there, what happens? What's, how do you play this out then? If you say, well, you can't, you can't deploy automated machines to fill your labor gap, where are we going? I think one way to think about this is draw this out 100 years from now and just think, do we really believe that we're not going to have autonomous machines in the field? I, I pick your time horizon, whatever. If you think it's not 100 years, call it 200 years. At some point, we're going to have autonomy out in these fields for sure. If you don't believe that, then I'm not really sure I, I know where your head's at. But let's just say that it's going to happen at some point. So maybe we can roll the time frame back and just say, how do we plot a course to get there? Maybe we need to do it in a way that's responsible. Maybe we need to do it in a way that has remote monitoring and observation from humans to make sure everything's okay. All right, fine, all of that stuff. But let's plot a responsible course instead of just digging our heels in and pretending like this isn't coming. Yeah, I, you're good. Thank you. Um, I, I'll agree with everything Paul said, but augment it a little bit too. I think um, there's, there's, three, there's three important points to make here. The first is, um, anything we do needs to be done with regulators, right? Um, this technology, um, you know, it, there is a potential for misuse or clumsiness, um, and, we, and we do need standards around what we allow in our fields. 
um, you know, in our in our workplaces to make sure it's safe. Um, and so I, I personally am completely on board with that. Um, it, we, I, we'd like to see it happen sooner, um, but there there needs to be some governance there. Um, I think the the second thing too to really point out, um, you know. We have this labor shortage, but it's not, at least as far as autonomy, it's, it's like making autonomous tractors doesn't fix the shortage. I think we have half of the workers we need in California. Um, it augments the workforce. And when you think about what autonomy actually does is it's creating more accessibility to this industry. Folks who might self-select out and say, hey, I, I can't work for 12 hours straight in 105 degree heat, um, you know, working, you know, working in either specialty crops or, you know, tree nuts or, or lettuce or whatever. Um, Having autonomy actually allows more inclusive, um, we, can, we can be more inclusive of who we hire and who we, who we consider for these jobs because the jobs are easier and they take a different skill set in addition to upskilling the, 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 the folks in the industry already. Like it's a net win um, and I think it's incumbent on us to really point that out and share that story. Well, and I wonder too, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, kind of the labor scarcity uh, issue at play here, but I wonder if does further, um, you know, acceleration of aut autonomy within agriculture, are we working toward kind of a different issue of labor scarcity in terms of the folks that can turn a wrench on one of these autonomous machines and do the computer programming on it? I mean, do you have the folks that, uh, Paul and Agino, do you all have the folks that you need to deploy new technologies within your companies? Oh, no, of course not. I mean, um, we, you know, as, as a startup, I mean, this is what recruiting is the hardest thing and um, sort of the extension of what Paul said, working with growers themselves, I mean, um, the secret weapon to Bear Flag was our field tech team. It was folks who grew up in rural communities, folks from Salinas, folks from the Midwest, um, folks from the Central Valley, from Hanford, California, Visalia, um, and they had a strong passion to bring this technology to their communities, um, and they joined our teams with an ag background, and they'd interface with the engineers that we had um, recruited, you know, in you know more traditional engineering schools, um, and we, we formed this super team of folks who, under, who were domain experts, not only in the technology, but also in the agriculture and this shared language is one of the like I, I, I'm getting prickles on my skin It was one of the coolest parts of building bear flag was bringing these worlds together um, And to your point the the recruiting finding people who are excited about this and want to work on it day in day out Will sacrifice their weekends and their nights um, to make this dream reality is super tricky um, And um, you know fi finding finding good people is the hardest part of any company yeah, Ditto 100% the same we our field team is top-notch and it's one of the most important parts of the company and we rely on them every day, all day, and we're always hiring into that group, just like you said, people out of Salinas, people out of all the farming communities that we're a part of. And, uh, you know, we, I think they're great jobs. We try to play, pay great salaries, you know, we give people equity in the company, um, and there's always an opportunity to learn more in that kind of job, and I think we're helping, you know, move those folks into more type of knowledge work. Um, in which they can embark in a whole new career. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, companies that don't do that, that decide they're just going to ivory tower code alone and write some software and produce something, put it on the field, those companies die because they don't know how to run stuff in the field and they don't know how hard it is and they're not prepared. Joni, you and I could probably talk for a couple of hours about the issues of uh, maintenance technicians and all the other uh, kinds of, uh, you know, labor issues facing equipment dealers. How does that issue get further complicated when we start adding these new layers of technology into the conversation? Well, it really does, because I think it shows the dichotomy of somebody who turns a wrench and has techno technology experience. I mean, that's the key thing. I mean, it's simple. A, a technician has to have the technological expertise to, um, you know, to diagnose and to use the machinery, the calibration, all of the tools that they need to repair their equipment. And you know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, I think is really concerning in, in California specifically because of the policy issues is that rather than looking at this as an opportunity to retrain an entire workforce, um, they're looking at it as, a, as an opportunity to take employment away. I mean, you could retrain a workforce or at least develop policy, uh, you know, a, um, a concerted effort. I mean, years and years ago, when I was young, I'm not that old, <laughs> but the government literally had a workforce policy. You know, they had a plan and a strategy, um, you know, to drive kids who didn't want to go to college into trade school and all the different um, opportunities, and they're not doing that anymore. And so, therefore, you have this huge void, and, and it's... 
I, I, when we were at FIRA last year, one of our dealers was there and I asked him the same question. He said, you know what, we could hire 10 technicians today if we had those qualified people. You know, so I think it's a great opportunity to develop a, a really um, good strategy for training people in all of these areas. I think policymakers should look seriously at that. One of the things that we'll uh, probably be talking about with our Farm Bill panel uh, later on in the conversation here today is uh, some requests that uh, the Specialty Crop Farm Bill Alliance has put forward uh, to encourage some funding for agricultural automation, both the adoption of it as well as research into it. Um, I, I, I know this is potentially a loaded question for, for, uh, for the two of you, considering that you're you know, private companies talking here, but where do you see as the big research gaps in, in automation and autonomy that could potentially be you know, addressed through additional uh, federal funding uh, at, at kind of a farm bill level? Well, I will say, first of all, that the perspective in DC appears to be that they don't get a consistent message from especially crop growers. That they, that they don't feel they get the same level of a consistent set of requests or messaging from the specialty crop growers. So I would like to see over time uh, more folks in California, where a lot of the specialty crops are grown, kind of get together and produce a more cohesive coalition to bring the message to DC. Um, that's the first thing. Do I think that there are areas where federal funding could help with research and development? I don't know. Honestly, I feel like the better way to run that equation is the other way around and provide incentives for growers to be able to afford the equipment and then let people build machinery to fit into those slots. Um, so if you're giving a grant for people to reduce the, utilize, reduce the usage of herbicides, let's say, um, they would be able to more easily afford something like a laser weeder and there are other products as well. Um, and I think that's the better way to drive the incentive than it would be to just federally fund some kind of research. At least that's been my experience, that you let the market dynamics drive the incentive instead of funding the research because what's the next step? Quick, I mean, that's sort of what's driven the farmer program in the state of California is that they provided the incentive funding to replace tier one and tier two tractors with tier three and above. So that's kind of along the lines of what you're talking sure, about. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I believe it was Paul. Um, he's, he said it. So I uh, did have a question from the audience that I'd uh, like to entertain and would encourage all of you to play a role in the conversation, submit questions via Slido and let us know if there's something you'd like to hear from the panel. Um, and uh, question probably best addressed for uh, Paul, but I'd uh, be interested in anyone's uh, response to it. Wondering, uh, for technology involving pest management, can you detail what is needed from regulators to allow such technology uh, to be used? Yeah, so... Um what is, so, okay, so I'll talk about this from the point of view of, of technology that is um, not biologic, biologic because I'm, that's not my background, okay? So for us in particular, for things like laser weeder, um, you know, right now, because we have no crop inputs, we're basically good to go. Um, what I would like to see is a little more clarity around the definition of organic. Um, because there's always questions about that. Um, and um, it, if you talk to the folks on the Hill, you know, that's even murky to, to them. Um, and so, you know, we kind of go back and forth on that a little bit. Um, for, you know, for, but generally I think incentives to reduce things that are, have negative downstream inf uh, effects would be helpful. Um, so, you know, the ways that we produce herbicides also release a tremendous amount of greenhouse gases. We talked earlier about um, the dangers of not, I won't say dangers, but the, let's just call it the concern about some of the water recharge efforts pushing stuff down in the water table. I understand that we don't think that's happening. We don't have any evidence that that's happening, but it's at least something people have to worry about, and it's because of all those years of stuff we've dumped into the ground. Um, so I would like to see more incentives to prevent those kinds of chemical sprays to just be pushed into the ground, not just for what happens over the long term as we try to do water recharge, but what happens with all the runoff. Uh, what happens in the food supply? What happens to the farmers over a lifetime of exposure to this stuff, right? You've seen the lawsuits, right? Um, there's a lot of concern about what this stuff is. Um, and frankly, we don't always really know. 
right? And so I would like to see more incentives towards, you know, reducing those kinds of um, usage of those products, which, you know, might, we might be a little concerned about. Um, and, uh, you know, if you compare it, they're, they're, they take a lot heavier hand in some of the other countries that could be good or bad, but there's certainly lots of precedent for being more uh, restrictive on these things and still being able to produce reasonable crops. I want to go to Gino on the, the regulatory question, but before we do, I just wanted to follow up something quickly that you said, Paul, uh, in terms of the question on organic. Are, are, can you expand on that? I mean, are you being told that potentially your technology can't be used on organic crops because of the, the lasers involved, or what, no, what's involved there? No, just that um, there's a definition. Organic has, uh, organic is, has become a definition of labeled inputs, um, but there's no, but not a process. And so to say, um, you know, anything that uses this process is by definition organic has been left up to the folks who do organic certification. And so it would be nice as technology evolves to be not just something you spray, but something that you do, that there would be an easy and quick certification process for that. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So then uh, switching from the, uh, you know, weed management to the uh, autonom autonomous operation of, of equipment, can you just walk us through the, the regulatory hurdles that, uh, that a technology like yours needs to, needs to clear, not only in, in this particular state, but just generally speaking? Yeah, so um, varying degrees of regulation. Um, California, um, the vast majority of states have um, no specific regulation around autonomy in agricultural environments. And um, California very sensibly, uh, several decades ago, introduced some legislation. Um, and I, th this is kind of a side, maybe it's, it's not too relevant, but folks will find it interesting. Um, when, you're, um, doing, when you're doing tractor operations during harvest or laying pipe, um, the, the tractor generally goes at what's called in a creeper gear. It's like half a mile an hour or a mile an hour. Um, and so what guys were doing was jumping out and helping the crew behind the tractor as the tractors went down the field, um, which um, it, when, done, when done properly is okay, but there needs to be some regulation and you can't drive the tractor too fast and it needs to um, have some like shut off stuff and um, you know some some kill switches and things like that. That's sensible. Um, but if you if you look at the regulation very literally, um, it seems to limit um, you know modern autonomous technology. And so the work we're doing is how can we update these regulations to really reflect the state of technology today um, in the state of California. I ask you a question. <laughs> Does deer support uh, autonomy generally uh, as an external uh, plug-in? for other applications, or is deer trying to walled garden it uh, too much? And I'll preface yeah, the question yeah. by saying, uh, I can't preface it because I already put it out there. Um, uh, I'll postscript it <laughs> by saying in the United States, for example, um, you can't really use TIM as part of the ISOBUS standard to control the speed of your tractor. In Europe, they all talk about TIM all day long, and they got, a, they got TIM, 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 TIM. Track, uh, uh, tractor implement management, uh, but for whatever reason, specifically in the United States, specifically from deer, there's a huge amount of pushback. And so are they trying to, I guess, I, I'll, yeah, they, let's just use the term they, um, are they trying to stop this or are they trying to support this? W what is happening? Yeah, um, I don't speak on behalf of like deer strategy, right? I'm a, I'm a technologist. Um, but um, I, I, I don't have any plans to support third party autonomy um, at deer right now. Another question that was uh, that was asked similar uh, on a similar front for Agino uh, five years from now, uh, just w uh, if you could take a, a swing a swing at this, what percentage of new large tractors sold do you think will have a, a autonomous or a driver optional capability? A hundred percent. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I mean this is a long march, right? Um, autonomy works really well in specific applications, um, and what you've seen from Deer. Uh, publicly, um, of course, is the autonomous 8R. It was announced at CES a year and a half ago. It was a huge splash, um, and, uh, and and it makes sense too. And sort of from the outside, we anticipated this as well. And I said tillage before. Tillage is um, basically ground prep. You're you're pulling blades um, or or um, you know blades or chisels across a field, preparing it um, for um, either to incorporate the residue after the fall harvest or prepare it um, for planting, as, as folks in this room know. Um, but it's a it's a relative simple job and it's one that's done um, more or less the same across many 
farms in the world, and so it's a good candidate for autonomy. If you look at more specific, like nuanced things, like um, irrigation applications of tractors, or um, you know, shakers and tree nut orchards, much smaller market, much more specific, much more ins and outs, and we might not see automation there for quite a while. Um, so really, the trick is, you know, starting any sort of endeavor or program or company or product is like, what's the broadest swath of value we can create for the minimal amount of effort? Um, and that means, unfortunately, there's this long tail of tractor operations um, for a that just won't see um, autonomy technology, I think, for, for quite a while. Paul, a couple of questions specific to your technology you submitted as well. I'll just ask those for you. Uh, wondering, uh, can you apply your technology to orchards, uh, uh, orchard crops to control weeds uh, within tree rows, uh, you know, specifically the more permanent crops as opposed to the row crops? Yeah, we get this question all the time. So we, uh, the answer is we could, but we need a different form factor, and we haven't had time to work on that yet. Um, so it's on our roadmap, but it's very sort of tentative, and we need to spend some time on it. If whoever asked that question wants to talk more, I would love to talk about that um, with you. Um, and again, this is an area where we need some grower partners to sort of to help us along the way um, with some field trials, some advice, that, you know, etc. We can't do anything without our farmer helps, and so that's just that's going to be super important. Uh, if you want to, if you actually want to engage in a project with us, please come see me, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit. And similar uh, form factor to, to what you mentioned, wondering if your technology can be fitted to drones, and I guess I'll expand that to any kind of uh, airborne technology. Yeah, okay, so drones come in two flavors. They're either fixed wing or they're multi-rotor. Um, a fixed wing drone has to maintain a minimum airspeed, and for something that's heavy, it would have to be quite fast. Um, something that's moving fast is gonna have a very hard time hitting all those weeds uh, with lasers, and so, you really kind of pretty quickly whittle it down to a multi-rotor. The multi-rotors can hover and go at whatever speed they would need. And in the UAV space, the big limitation right now is battery power. You just can't get enough flight time off of the existing battery technologies to make that work. There are companies who are building or have built versions uh, that, uh, of solutions that produce a um, a fuel-based turbine generator to produce the kind of power that the that the drones need um, to do something like that. So maybe t potentially in the future, but we don't have anything like that on the road roadmap right now. Um, I'm kind of wondering the benefit of the drones would be would be what though that maybe getting between fields faster or something like that. Um, but you got to remember that for every you know second that your machine on the ground is just sitting there and consuming you know, almost no energy to hold itself up, the drone is consuming an incredible amount of energy to maintain altitude, right? The volume, uh, the, the, to hold the mass of the thing in the air, you need to push an equal mass of, of air down. And that is happening you know, all throughout the flight path of that thing. So it's an incredible amount of energy just to keep the thing aloft. Uh, it works great for cameras, of course. Um, but I think there's a long way to go before you start actually doing, you know, implements in the sky. Good deal. I uh, have a question that was submitted. I'd like to hear all three of your thoughts on it. But, Joni, I'm going to go to you with it first. Uh, uh, from uh, Jeff Jurgens, wondering, how can the folks in this room uh, help to move autonomy in California forward? What, what would be a, if you, if, they, if you had the opportunity to give this, the folks in this room a uh, call to action, what would that be? Well, they had a hearing on February 16th, and it was largely those opposed. So I think, you know, actively engaging with um, legislators, regulators, is really critical because the, I want to say the naysayers, the opposition is a louder voice. Um, and I also think education is huge, you know. Um, I think as much time as you can to educate people who are, who are um, in opposition and helping them understand. Um, I know that when, at, at the Tulare Farm Show, they, they had a, a, a demo with uh, the Cal OSHA board and nobody really said anything, it was kind of interesting, but um, I think they all learned a lot. And I think that really is, uh, is really critical because, um, Obviously, ag is a huge economy here in California. And, uh, you know, the push for automation is driven by increasing costs, uh, labor issues, um, you know, safety, la labor safety issues. 
And if you have people going around saying that, you know, this is dangerous, um, it's obviously not going to get very far. So I just think it's really important that you engage the people who are making the decisions. Yeah, I think um, if growers and farmers can say that they, that they want it, they need it, um, uh, that would go a long way. And then I think for technology companies like ourselves, we could probably do a better job of working with the regulators along the way and maybe doing something where uh, it wasn't so all or nothing, but in a more stepped in fashion that would make people more, more comf comfortable with it potentially. Um, I had another thing, but I forgot. Yeah. I, I really can't add much to what um, Joni and Paul said. It's um, it's education. It's um, if you uh, if you're in agriculture, call your representative. Um, make sure they know the, the value that autonomy can bring um, to your business and your operation. Um, and then too, I'll just my like straw poll. Like my my casual observation is um, the folks um, the folks who are more resistant to autonomy um, probably misunderstand how the technology works um, and the safety mechanisms that we've um, that we've designed into them. I, I just remembered the thing I wanted okay. to bring up. So Let's hear it. Let's I've hear heard it. this many times today, which is uh, you need to get to know your regulators. Okay, I mean, that's, that's, that's great advice. Um, I think one thing maybe to realize that I'm sure you, you ran into this as well, uh, when you're focused all day on making your machines work and, you know, you've got a team of engineers and, and mechanical engineering folks and we're all out in the field all day and we're getting sunstroke and trying to figure out what's not working and whatever, the last thing on your mind is who are my regulators, and so I think there's a bit of a um, it, there's a bit of a shock that comes to companies when they get probably to our size, where you're like, oh, how many layers of regulation are there, and how do I meet these folks, and uh, what do I need to do to even understand what that landscape looks like, and so in most of those cases, the answer uh, turns out to be. Uh, hire some consultants to help you figure it out. And so it creates this sort of step function where until you get to the point that you have the time and capital to be able to do that, it's impossible to meet your regulators. Um, and so that's, you know, I think that that's kind of unfortunate in ways that we could maybe ease that giant gap might be nice. I would also point out that, that the technology that you're talking about, what's driving it is safety, labor you know, the application of pesticides and um, the crops, you know, the specialty crops and orchards. Um, so I think that's another important point to make when you're talking to regulators is that, you know, this technology is going to help um, keep workers safer in, the, in specific areas. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put a pin in the conversation that's taking place from the stage at this point, but I uh, would encourage all of you to continue the conversation amongst yourselves, uh, you know, chat with our panelists uh, in this break that we have coming up. We have a reception later uh, today. I don't think we have had the last uh, conversation that we have had about agricultural autonomy here today. I feel like this is going to be a subject uh, that's going to stick around for a little while here in the future of this industry. But for now, please join me in thanking these three panelists.